where we go. Um, welcome, this is Allison Weir from the National Diver Bank Network. And today we're going to talk a bit about fiscal sponsorship, what it is, how you get one, and what sort of questions you might want to ask if you're considering going into uh, fiscal, sponsor, fiscal sponsorship. So the first question And we're going to talk a little bit about what fiscal sponsorship is, pros and cons, um, how to look for a fiscal sponsor. And then we've got, I'm really excited to say that we have three diaper bank um, representatives who are currently fiscally sponsored projects, so fiscal sponsors, and there are a lot of different, there, it's a nice diversity of size and experience, so I think we'll have some great insight from them. So I'm going to keep the formal presentation fairly short so that we can get the most we can out of their experience. The first, I think, one of the first basic things is, and by the way, happy ha happy tax day. Um, fiscal sponsorship is a way of getting 501c3, the benefits of 501c3 status without actually having applied to it uh, for yourself. So the, probably the first basic question to ask, answer is, what exactly is a 501c3 status? And really all it is is a designation in the IRS code of nonprofit charitable organizations who are exempt from paying federal income tax. And because, they're, because they have this designation, people who donate to them can also deduct their donations from their federal income tax in most cases. Nonprofit and tax exempt are not the same thing. So you, it, a nonprofit basically means you're just not making any money or that, that any money generated directly back into the organization. So, for example, Hughes Aircraft Corporation, when, when run by um, Howard Hughes, was a nonprofit, but it was not a tax deduct, a tax charitable um, organization. Hughes didn't take any money out of it; he just poured it back into the organization. What we're looking at, 501c3s, and, and all of the, the diaper banks who are 501c3s don't make any profit um, in that nobody's pulling, nobody's taking money away from the um, the organization that that doesn't get built into buying more diapers and, and support staff. It goes along with the, uh, the basic mission. And because they have it, the, um, they are recognized, their charitable purpose is recognized by the, the IRS and they have all their ducks in line and have uh, put in their application and it's been approved, they are exempt from paying uh, income tax. Just because you're doing profitable, uh, doing charitable stuff, doesn't mean you're not exempt from paying income tax unless you've got the IRS to tell you that it's, they agree. So what is fiscal sponsorship? Fiscal sponsorship is a legal agreement in a tax exempt organization, that's or organization doing something charitable that the 501c3 organization will agree to take under its wing. The project might collect funding from the 501c3, but basically the 501c3 um, serves as sort of the the overseeing guiding principle, um, guiding organization for the project. And there are a couple of different models, uh, some where the 501c3 has complete control over the, the um, project and others where it's more of a contract relationship or um, that it, the, five, the project has a bit more autonomy, but in, in all cases, donations are, that are made to the project go through the 501c3, and are donations to the 501c3, which then, under its agreement with the project, provides funding to the project, and it may provide funding from only from those donations in the name of the project, or from its own funds, um, or from other sources, other unrestricted funds to the, the organization as the 501c3. But we'll go into more detail in, in what those those um, different models are. But basically, one of the bottom lines are that the the project must be charitable in nature, and it should fit within the sponsor's mission. So if you have a 501c3 arts organization, would not be a great fit for a diaper project unless that diaper project is going to benefit artists, for example. Diaper banks and fiscal sponsors 
uh, the reason we're bringing this up is because they're, they're often a, a great, it's a great fit because cyber banks themselves have, as terrible organizations go, a fairly low bar to entry. You basically have to have a place, you have to be able to get a bunch of diapers, and you have to have a place to store it. Um, as, as charitable organizations go, that's a pretty pretty easy do. And for a lot of them, the actually getting the 501c3 itself is the biggest bar to entry. Um, because you, and it will get into more details of, of what is required in a 501c3 application, but usually you need lawyers, you need accountants, you need a lot of bureaucracy. Um, while diaper banks are often out of somebody's living room um, or they're complementary to a lot of other nonprofit missions that might already have been established as a, a nonprofit organization that a diaper bank is a natural extension of. So there are a lot of 501c3s um, and there are a lot of reasons for being a 501c3. First off, the organization is exempt from federal income tax uh, and federal unemployment tax. Um, and a lot of times, a lot of states recognize federal uh, organizations have been designated as tax exempt by the, 501, by, by the, um, the IRS can often apply for tax exemption from state income tax or from state sales tax, depending on the state. A lot of them, you know, if you have a 501c3 and the application basically says, should give us your, your 501c3 designation and we will also recognize you as, as exempt. Um, a lot of, of funders require that an organization have its 501c3 designation, mostly because it allows the, the um, funder to take the donation off their tax um, as, as an exemption, as, as a deduction. Um, and also, the other, the, really, it's kind of a, a, um, a weird good thing, but one of the benefits of having a 501c3 status is that the process of gathering all the documentation required really helps you put meat on your organization, formalize your mission, uh, formalize your, your operating rules and procedures, and sort of provides you the basic bureaucracy that helps allow for smooth operations and uh, administration of your, your program. And the fact that you've gone through the whole process and have been designated a 501c3 by the IRS can give you a real credibility boost. The cons of a 501c3 status and why, why a lot of smaller programs often ought not to, to, um, to go that route can be is there's a lot of paperwork involved. It's a very lengthy application. Um, and you really do need an accountant and an attorney to, to sort of navigate through it to make sure you have the right documents of incorporation, the right accounting of, of um, where the money's coming in, going out, um, and, and all the record keeping required that goes along with it. It's a fairly expensive um, process, not only because of the lawyers, um, but also because the application fee itself. And it does require that you have formal governance structure and, and trappings. You, you should have your own. You need to have an independent board, which means you know, articles of incorporation um, with the state. It means um, bylaws. It means um, a lot of uh, procedures. And it also means that you have to follow the rules uh, of for soliciting contributions, acknowledgement, and, and recording those contributions. Um, so it, it is, it's, it's a bureaucratic um, process. And for a lot of people who just want to go into, the, you know, want to give out diapers, as quickly as possible, it, it does sort of become a bar to entry um, to that mission. So this sort of leads one to the, the pros of the fiscal sponsorship, and that allows you to provide the, the service of, of getting diapers at rather than spending all your time with setting up the bureaucracy. Some of the, the problems, some of the benefits of 501c3 status are, are um, can be conferred on to, to projects who um, have fiscal sponsors because a lot of government grants, a lot of, of uh, funders also will recognize, um, will give money to a project of a recognized 501c3 organization uh, who are fiscally sponsored. Um, and the other thing too is a fiscal sponsor having um, all the, the bureaucracy that goes along with being a 501c3 
and provide you a lot of the back office support, the the financial reporting, the um, administrative of um, processes, uh, and also the governance structure too. Um, in order to be a, as a project for 501c3, the 501c3's board will have to have gone through your project and, and agreed to, to take on responsibility for the project. So you'll have the benefits having a board governance. Um, and of course, you don't have to pay for the, the legal fees and filing fees of the 501c3 uh, or the lawyer that goes along with it. The cons, um, if you want, Autonomy, you might want to think not about being a, five, a, a fiscal sponsor because the sponsor organization is required by law to exercise over, oversight over your activities. They can't simply act as a pass through for donations for you. They have to be able, they have to be in charge of the, um, the funds. Uh, the IRS t does not take kindly to pass through, so if you wanted, you know, if um, you told the you want to start a project and you call the 501c3. Well, this is fine. You know, um, just have um, I'll just have them make all the have my donors make the check out to you, and you can just give the checks to me. Isn't going to fly uh, because that's seen by the IRS as skirt the rules for nonprofit status. So you, the your fiscal sponsor will have to to have some say over how you operate. Um, want to be able to do um. Do, how you spend your funds, because ultimately they're responsible for it. That also means you have some record keeping and reporting, periodic reporting, um, they want to know where the money is going and how it's, they, they were granted, is getting spent. Um, you'll have to have some kind of a contract and guidelines provided by the sponsor. And you may also find yourself in, in um, with a bit of a funding conflict too. You're going to want a sponsor that has a similar mission. They may be going after the same donors you are, um, so that be you know, an issue. And a lot of fiscal sponsors, because they're providing oversight, they're providing administra administration, they're providing all the accounting background for uh, uh, support for filing taxes for your project. They, they charge a fee for their services. So. Uh, could I ask, um, just sort of take a moment out, if you, um, in the meantime, can you mute yourself uh, while I'm speaking, and then we'll, we'll open up to questions as we get through the, um, the conference, uh, through the, the presentation. If you have a question, just type it in on the chat or um, raise your hand. Thanks. So, given the pros and the cons of fiscal sponsorship, how do you know what is right for you? Talk to other people. And we've got a great panel today of people who are uh, fiscally sponsored, and they should be able to find some uh, insight. Make a list of what it is you want in your organization. Do you value autonomy, or do you want value um, being able to get stuff out as quickly as possible? Do you want, um, do you mind, uh, are you an organized person who can do back uh, the required uh, bookkeeping and um, or do you think that you better um, serve as a project that could augment another organization? Talk to your attorney, your accountant, people who you know um, who might be able to provide some advice on this. And remember, you can start as a fiscal sponsor and become a 501c3 in, uh, later. It's, it's not an all or nothing proposition. We're going to talk about two primary models of fiscal sponsorship, and I want to recommend to everybody a really great book um, by Gregory L. Colvin, who's sort of the guru of fiscal sponsorship. Uh, fiscal sponsorship: Six Ways to Do It Right, uh, published by the Study Center Press, uh, 2000, and I'm using 2005's second edition. I think he may have updated it since. Um, I found it on Amazon. I think you can still find it on Amazon or um, through your library. So the first model is um, model A, the comprehensive fiscal sponsorship. And this is where, where the project really is just sort of carved out of the, the main sponsor. It might be, um, for example, a food bank decides it wants to give out diapers and they want to sort of account for all of that a bit separately. 
Um, the project in, it belongs entirely to the, the sponsor. It's not its own separate entity. But, and the project personnel are, are employees or, or volunteers for the sponsor. Everything goes in goes to the sponsor. The sponsor is, is um, directly responsible for um, providing the contributions to the project. Uh, and the sponsor holds on to all liability. They're the ones reporting the revenue expenses. Um, the sponsor may choose to have an advisory committee for the project, you know, maybe the, um, the Dagger Bank Committee, or, or um, that can sort of make recommendations to the sponsor of, of uh, on various things about the, the project, like what the budget should be or anything along those lines. But ultimately, is all the sponsor owns everything. Well, that was the other thing I forgot to mention, um, a benefit of fiscal sponsorship. Fiscal sponsor may uh, provide you the insurance, uh, too, if you're, uh, if you're not sure, but uh, as well as some other um, legal background, uh, uh, administrative costs. Anyway, so the, the legal steps, basically, um, the project um, director or advisory committee has a, a, an agreement with the sponsor. Um, the board has approved the sponsorship program um, and all the fundraising is done in the name of the sponsor. It really is it, sort of the, the board of the sponsor says we want to have a separate project, but it's not legally separate and apart from the, the sponsor. The pre-approved grant model, of, or the known as Model C in Colvin's book, and here the, the project is separate and apart from the sponsors. The, 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 uh, the grantee um, has its project, and it, in a lot of cases it's, it's um, approached the sponsor and says, you know, we, we, we want to do this. Um, it, it is a separate legal entity. Uh, and it may not, it's not a 501c3 yet, but it, it, it is separate and apart from the sponsor. Um, the project personnel are apart, don't work for the sponsor. Uh, the charitable contributions go to the sponsor first, and then the sponsor, uh, those, the, 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 but the, the, the contributions are indeed the sponsors, which they decide to grant in accordance with the agreement um, provide. Uh, through the, made with the, um, the grantee. But the grantee is liable for the project. Um, the sponsor reports the contributions in and the grants out, and the grantee reports the grants in and the expenses out. They're two separate reportings to the IRS, uh, and the sponsor retains discretion and control over the funds. A pre-approved grant has a few more steps than just carving out a project within the sponsor under Model A. You have to have written a proposal for the project to the, the sponsor um, that is evaluated and uh, of, um, approved by the board. And the, um, that approval may come either before or after um, a proposed grant agreement is written. Uh, you want to make sure that the solicitation of funds for the project um, is listed uh, in the name of the, um, the sponsor, but if you want, you know, the, the, if the, the funds are to go to the, the grant, the grantee, they should be um, identified as such, and they're considered restricted funds at that point. Um, and that, that of course, adds um, additional accounting for identifying the funds that are restricted for the grantee and. Um, then, of course, it requires that the grantee report back to the sponsor on how those funds were used. So, since the fiscal sponsor is taking on the liability um, and also, you know, is, is being asked to send their money, money that would otherwise be going to them, to this project, why do people, why do people go into fiscal sponsorship? What, what is it, what's in it for the fiscal sponsor? And I think this is important to understand, too, when you're going out looking for a fiscal sponsor, just so you have a better feel for what kind of organizations might be interested in um, sponsoring your program. For a lot of fiscal sponsors, it's a way of branching out 
from their central mission, um, but within the same core core program. So if um, a food bank, for example, is has been getting a lot of requests, it gives out food um, and has been getting a lot of requests for diapers and other basic needs, having a diaper project is a way of, or having a, um, spo help sponsoring a diaper project that would benefit their agencies as well is a way of, of branching out. Um, it also allows uh, the fiscal sponsor who, who tends to, I mean, especially since you're talking about well-established programs, they tend to have a, um, a fairly strict, um, a, a, a more, um, a, a bigger uh, administrative burden. It allows them to branch out and try different things within the, the realm of, of projects, um, be a little entrepreneurial, a little more flexible because their projects are smaller, they're, they're smaller uh, they can make decisions more quickly uh, and act more more rapidly uh, without the um, the process of going through. Provided, they, of course, they've been approved by those boards, um, and it also allows the fiscal sponsor to foster new communication, community leadership, to to, to foster new programs, to, to start entrepreneurs off on their on their way by being the um, the supportive back office structure for new and interesting ideas of how to um, improve the world uh, in a way that the sponsor currently isn't doing but um, and isn't can't really sort of jump off to something different. So you want to find a fiscal, you have a great project, you want to find a fiscal sponsor. You didn't grow up immediately out of a, an organization like a food bank. How do you find a fiscal sponsor? And I, we'll be talking with the panel a little bit about this on, on what they've, they've done. But the first thing you want to make sure is you have a similar mission. You don't want to approach a museum if, you're, if what you're trying to do is give out diapers. You want to make sure that they're, they're, they at least make sense. You want to also want to know how the fiscal sponsor will work with you. Uh, what kind of contract would they propose? How often do you report? Are you um, co-located? Are they imagining that you... you um, get assumed within their organization or that you, you um, are maintain a separate identity, what, what's the level of involvement they want to be in? Do they want, you know, what kind of um, requirements do they want you to, to be involved in their program? Uh, do you have to report to the board on a regular basis? Do you have to report to um, the program director on a regular basis? What kind of involvement do they want to um, be in, in your organization? What level of decision making do they want to make uh, have over uh, your expenditure of funds? What kind of fees are they going to charge you? Uh, as I said earlier, fiscal sponsors often charge a bit of a fee to cover their uh, their um, administrative costs in administering the program. How much is that? Talk to their current projects and see how they're run. What kind of their what kind of relationship they have with the fiscal sponsor? What are the reporting requirements for the fiscal sponsor? How are the the funds managed? Are they um, separated in separate uh, bank accounts, um, what kind of accounting do you have, and fundraising procedures, what sort of, um, how do they account for fundraising for the project, uh, and how do they distinguish their fundraising raising procedures from yours? A couple of things to look for in a, a fiscal sponsor. There's a, a national network of fiscal sponsorship um, Sponsors, and there's also some organizations that are accredited fiscal sponsors that do this on a large scale. Um, that certainly is, is one great way of, of ensuring that they have procedures and that they're, they're familiar with the process of being a fiscal sponsor. Make sure they have reserves for their operation. Um, check their, their references for leadership and financial services. You might note too that the really professionalized fiscal sponsors like Tides and a few other organizations often require that a project have already done their own level of fundraising um, and to have a certain uh, threshold amount before they take on that project as a fiscally sponsored project of their, their program. There are a lot of resources on Foundation Center, on, on, um, on fiscal sponsorship. The Foundation Center has a bunch, um, especially for getting to feel, feel for what it takes um, to be a fiscally sponsored pro program. Um, 
The Tide Center, as I mentioned, is, is a uh, large financial fiscal sponsor for a lot of organizations uh, in California. Take a look at the IRS um, articles and uh, what they say about um, nonprofit and fiscal sponsorship. And then um, there's also a couple of websites on stayexempt.org um, and another one on fiscalsponsorships.com, which um, I found useful. So I'm going to open this, this um, discussion up to a panel discussion. Uh, we have, we're, I'm really thrilled that we have three panelists um, from three different uh, diaper banks of, of different sizes and uh, experiences who can help explain what they've done as fiscal spon fiscally sponsored programs, um, why they went that route, and what they would recommend to folks looking for a fiscal sponsor. So we've got Lisa Chong of Help a Mother Out. Uh, located in, in San Francisco, the San Francisco area through the Project of the Community Initiatives. Jackie Lang and Francesca Cook uh, of uh, Baby to Baby, which is a project of community partners in Los Angeles. And Anne McBroom, Small Hand, which is a project of the Edinburgh Christian Church in Edinburgh, um, Virginia. So if I could ask each of you in that order to tell me a little bit about why you chose fiscal sponsorship as opposed to your, why your organization chose fiscal sponsorship as opposed to going on the 501c3 route and immediately how you found your current fiscal sponsor and are you considering going independent um, and if so, why or why not? Lisa, would you mind starting? Yeah, um, thank you, Allison. Um, so let's see, to answer the first question, um, why we chose to go with the fiscal sponsorship route, I actually, before, um, starting um, a family and starting Help a Mother Out. I actually used to work for the Tide Center, so I was really familiar with the, the fiscal sponsorship model um, and what that model um, offered emerging projects and nonprofit um, initiatives. So um, I we chose fiscal sponsorship just because, you know, we knew that we didn't want to focus on um, building the infrastructure that it takes in order to um, start an independent um, 501c3 organization. Um, we knew that we wanted back office support, for instance, human resources, um, liability insurance, all that sort of thing. And, and the big thing is finance, the financial services was a, was a huge thing. Um, how we found our current fiscal sponsor, so our current fiscal sponsor is Community Initiatives. Um, we actually started out as, as a, a fiscally sponsored project for a, of a foundation here called Point Foundation, just because we were starting out with basically, you know, zero funds, and we needed um, a vehicle and a partner to help us raise enough money so that we met um, the, the financial threshold um, to, to go to community initiatives. And whether or not we have plans to go independent, yes, we do, but we really want to focus on building the organization right now. So I think that that's definitely in the long term, you know, a long term goal of ours. But, you know, it's really, we really are really happy with the services that were provided um, through our fiscal sponsor. And it really allows us to focus on our program and, and building the program and furthering our mission. Great, thanks. Jackie and Francesca, why is Baby to Baby a fiscal sponsor? Hi, Allison. Um, this is Jackie, and I'm here with Francesca. And we, so Baby to Baby was founded in 2006. Um, I think much like some of the other diaper banks in the network, um, some women were really, they're just running it out of their garage. And um, when, when they were sort of ready to grow a bit, um, my understanding is that our founders, who are no longer with us, um, didn't, didn't quite have the time and expertise to manage um, the financials, all the incoming donations, and some of the legal work. So they sort of um, looked for, for some help in that area. And, um, and they had a very small team. They didn't even have many volunteers. It was um, really just an effort um, among a, a handful of women who were friends. And um, they went to an organization called Community Partners, which is based here in LA, and they are a fairly large nonprofit who um, their main purpose is to fiscally sponsor other projects. So they have, I think, a, maybe 300, yeah, two or 300 projects under them, um, most of them with fairly small budgets. Um, 
And so when Francesca and I came on board a few years ago and our co-presidents came on board in 2011, um, who serve as our leadership now, they, they sort of inherited the fiscal sponsorship model. Um, and we've been with them um, since then. And I think um, for us, we, we've experienced a lot of growth in the last two years, and the services that they provide um, are very, very helpful. So they do all of our billing. They help us with our payroll for our small team here. Um, they, yeah, they do our insurance, they do of our human resources work, they help us with all of our contracts, uh, legal work and liability. So they've been really helpful in those areas, um, just because we don't have the expertise in those areas in-house and we really want to focus on our programming and um, we're just reaching out to the community and really getting diapers and clothing and gear into the community. That's, that's really where we want to focus and then also on fundraising um, and so having them to help us with that is really, really fantastic. Um, I would say that the, the downside of that is that rather than paying them for those services, they do take a percentage of every um, financial donation that we receive. Um, it's typically about 9% um, when individuals donate, and then for grants or government contracts, it can be up to 12%. Um, I think we're sort of split here in the office. I, I sort of feel like the, the services they provide are – really, really beneficial. Their expertise is fantastic. Um, it's certainly not something that we quite have the manpower to handle in-house at the moment. Um, I know uh, other of my colleagues would, would maybe disagree, and I think that our biggest, we all sort of agree that the biggest um, downside of that is that they do take a really, a, a pretty substantial chunk of what, of our financial donations. Um, and we don't always know, we don't always feel that that's exactly, um, yeah, we don't know that their services are quite up to, to what, you know, they're taking the exact same percentage out of every donation, and we don't, um, sometimes we feel like that's maybe more than what we're getting in return. Mm -hmm. um, so that said, we are, um, we filed to separate from community partners and um, have submitted our paperwork to become um, an independent 501c3, but it's certainly been, um, a pretty, long, a pretty long process, um, definitely takes a lot of time and energy and commitment, but we're excited about it, and um, we feel like we'll have some more autonomy once we do that, and I think that's sort of um, the main goal for us. Well, congratulations. That's wonderful. That, that's one, that does remind me of one thing I forgot to mention. The 501c3 process can take a long time. Um, mm -hmm. They say on average six months, but I think it's been taking a bit longer given the recent scrutiny of, of programs under the, um, the IRS lately, so I've heard of some programs taking as long as a year, so mm -hmm. fiscal Yeah, and I think for us, the, um, just to have that autonomy, because we are, I think it, it may be different if you were under another nonprofit that you were maybe one of their only um, projects. They didn't have such a why. I mean, this, this group that we're working with, they have hundreds of projects under them, so we don't quite get the... Um, the, the time that we need from them. Um, we kind yeah. of struggle with that. We like to turn things around really fast, and sometimes that's a long process with them. Um, there's a lot of paperwork, and um, because they're managing so many projects, um, we, we just don't quite have that autonomy. But um, but they do provide, you know, expertise in a lot of areas, and I think there there's a lot of things that we have been beneficial from partnering with them. Great. Thanks. Sure. And what have, has been your experience with Small Hand? Um, well, I guess we started out as an outreach program from Edinburgh Christian Church, so it was sort of natural that we would uh, look to them for our 501c3 status. Um, there are things about a church which make it um, a different type of uh, fiscal sponsor, in part because they're not required to file with the IRS. Um, and so there are some things that are very different about our situation, which when I looked at your beautiful PowerPoint, didn't always um, fit with what we have as our relationship. Um, but our reason was when we started four years ago, uh, we fitted Alison's description of something on a shoestring, something that needed to minimize costs. 
But I would add that we felt that we were an experiment in progress. We didn't know whether it was going to be feasible for us to raise the money to do what we wanted to do. And so we didn't feel that at that point we could really commit to an independent filing where we could um, state based on no experience um, exactly how we wanted to frame our mission and be uh, relatively confident that we could pull it off both in terms of manpower and money. So um, using a fiscal sponsor gave us the opportunity to um, experiment with what we wanted to do and to learn over the past four years where we want to go. Um, if anybody is interested, I think I could highlight some of the differences that happen when your sponsor is a church. Um, I don't know if ours is unique, <laughs> but I do know um, that some of the issues with separation and funding and everything else is, was different. Uh, and just to link in to the baby to baby, our sponsor doesn't take a penny of our funds for sponsoring us. Um, our relationship with them is that they have undertaken to have no financial responsibility for us, uh, but not to take anything of what we raise. Um, they do provide us uh, at no cost to us with our space and utilities and insurance. Um, did we look elsewhere? Not really in any um, very uh, intense way. We were approached by a very large not-for-profit hospital group who in a, with, within a few years wanted us to become a member of their programs. Um, but to be honest, having observed how they had uh, responded to other startups in our area and jettisoned them, uh, we we didn't take that seriously, mm -hmm. uh, but they were offering to fundraise for us in um, exchange for a sponsorship relationship. Um, we are actively exploring a 501c3 of our own, and it's probably for what sounds like odd reasons. Um, one is because of our church's um, non-filing with the IRS, we would like to gain more transparency of our funding. We are totally transparent within our own website about our income and expenses and um, where we stand financially. But I realize that to many people that is not the same as something which potentially could be audited. Um, so that is something I'd like uh, our own 501c3 status to bring. The other is that um, not in the land of the diaper, but in the land of getting um, some other materials which we want, uh, mainly food, um, we are barred from applying to some of the major grant holders like Kellogg simply on the basis of our relationship with the church. So it has some disadvantages for us. Oh, that, that's interesting, yeah. Does anybody have any questions for the panel? I have one question. Uh, Lisa, you had mentioned that uh, you had, a, had to meet a, uh, a threshold or you could be a member of community, of community initiative. What was that threshold? Uh, it was $30,000. Okay. Um, Tide Center, they, I believe, well, let's see, a few years ago, they, they had, their threshold was 100000 Um And I think, you know, there are larger fiscal sponsors that will not even talk to you until you get to 150. Um, so, but it, you know, I think it just it, it varies depending on on each organization. 
Right. And I think um, both you and Baby the Baby sort of are fiscal sponsor, fiscally sponsored projects of pretty large organizations that are, are um, in the business of fiscal sponsorship, I guess. Is, is, is that fair? Yeah, that's fair. I mean, we're on the Model A direct project model. Um, you know, I, I actually really appreciate all of their services. Um, you know, they do they do take an administrative fee, um, but for us to be able to build up our infrastructure in order to to utilize, you know, in order to have that infrastructure would actually probably cost us cost our program a lot more. Um, uh, you know, I mean, there's there's oversight certainly, but I, I actually appreciate that in terms of grant management. Um, and the structure that they provide in terms of budgeting. Great. Anyone have any questions? Jackie, you've been you mentioned that you guys are going through the process of of um, filing for a separate 501c3. How have you found the process to be? Has it been um, all that the, uh, as onerous as um, so much that you'd think maybe find another fiscal sponsor, or has it been fairly straightforward now that you've gotten your, because you, you have a fairly large organization too, compared to someone starting starting off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I'll let Francesca take that, because she has been managing managing that process. Great. Hi, Joanne. So um, I think the hardest part about the 501c3 application process was filling out the actual application. It's pretty long and tedious and requires a lot of information. And um, for our organization, we had to file, like you said, as a corporation first um, to get our articles and bylaws approved by the state. And then as the Baby to Baby um, Incorporated, we filled out the 501c3 application. So it was a lot of work to get the application filled out and complete and filed. Um, but we filed earlier this year, I want to say late January or early February, and we're looking at um, probably two to four more months. So it hasn't been that long, thankfully. We heard the same thing that you mentioned earlier, that it's about a six months to a year process um, timeline we look at once we file, but thankfully we are, we should hear back from them relatively soon. Okay, great, thanks. And you had mentioned there were certain challenges of, of being, in addition to the, the lack of, of transparency, um, to being a fiscally sponsored project of, of a church. What were some of the ones you find most difficult? Well, I think it, it really mainly hits us with grant applications. Um, there are some big foundations that um, ask, will accept from um, a church-linked 501c3, um, provided it's not part of the religious work of the church. Um, but we have learned, um, and Alison, you're more of a lawyer than I am by a long way, um, but we have a separate board from our church, and we have what they call no commingling of funds, um, which means that the funds we raise are separate and unique from the church's and we never give money to our church. The church never gives money to us. And that is seen as a requirement, for example, by the Ronald McDonald House Charities in mm -hmm. order to be eligible as a church-linked 501c3 to apply to them for a grant. But there are some organizations, um, and, and they're not necessarily... Um, I, I think the, the Kellogg Foundation, uh, the original Kellogg's were um, atheists and would not, you know, <laughs> incorporate right. an idea of a church link. That's, that's a, a, a moral stand of that group. Um, but there are also, for example, some big energy companies in our area um, who will not 
consider an application from um, a 501c3 church linked organization. And I don't know the reason for it. I don't know if it's their concern about transparency. Um, but it's, it, it simply is that, you know, you just can't get through the first hurdle of, of application. Yes, yeah, um, some, I mean, I, I know that Feeding America, for example, doesn't uh, take faith-based faith um, food banks. So, yes, yeah, some well, organizations, we, we I think, and I think you may be right, I think maybe because of the transparency. Um, oh, we belong to Feeding America. Oh no, I understand, but I mean, but the, the but the food banks, like if you wanted to be a food bank as opposed to a food oh. pantry. Oh, I, I'm sorry. Yes, um, and to be honest, I do not know um, what they have, what their experience is in terms of, of um, the problems that they see, um, and it, it it may not be sort of. Um, a broadly of interest, but for example, within our church, we can hold a separate bank account, completely separate from any other part of our church, uh, and that's a general um, a general facility for churches. So we we can actually do the no commingling with no problem. Okay. Um, but th that may be something which, if somebody is looking for um, a sponsor, it, it 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 can be very advantageous. It can be very uh, it can have some downsides. Right. Um, but it is a way of finding uh, a sponsor who uh, appreciates what you're doing and possibly will do it at no expense to you. Right. Interesting, okay. Does anybody have any questions um, for the panelists? Well, if I could ask the panelists to sum up the the best um, and the most challenging thing they've found being a physically sponsored project, and um, let's start with Lisa. Um, okay, yeah, this is Lisa. Um, I would say that the best um, part of being a fiscally sponsored project is that um, it's really enabled and empowered um, our organization, our grassroots organization to grow um, and focus on our mission um, and fundraise. Um, and I guess the, I guess my least favorite part of it is that, you know, um, and as Jackie had mentioned that, you know, there, there can be a little bit of a bureaucracy in terms of, you know, filing paperwork and, and, um, you know, and, and you're not the only client or, you know, project that, um, the fiscal sponsor is, is managing. So, um, you know, what, what, what is important to you may not necessarily be important to, you know, the finance director or the accountant. <laughs> so right. sometimes those kind, those sorts of things take a little while longer um, uh, and are a little bit more cumbersome. But, you know, I feel like it's, you know, it, it, in the end, it's, it's, it's worth it at this point in our, in our evolution. Great. Jackie, what do you guys think? Um, yeah, I, I, I agree with Lisa. I think um, the, the benefits are, are, are re they were really substantial for us, and I think they still are, um, especially as we've had a lot of growth in the last year or two, um, helping us sort of manage that growth and um, really to provide expertise about things that we were not quite experts in in-house has been really, um, really fantastic. And just um, having that sort of legal advice and um, an extra eye for contracts and um, things that just allow us to focus on our programming a bit more. Ha I think that's probably the, the best benefit we've received from our fiscal sponsor. Um, and I, I would say the old, you know, the challenge for us was just that lack of autonomy um, and sort of um, being a part of a bigger system that um, didn't allow us to move quite as quickly as, as we would have liked in some, some circumstances. Hey, great, thanks. And Anne? Well, we would never have been able to begin without uh, the, the backing of our sponsor. 
uh, we didn't have uh, the money or the manpower to go through a 501c3 before we opened our doors. Um, and it's allowed us to really um, experiment in a constructive way with how we, uh, what our mission was going to become. Um, the downside um, is that it, it, it forced on us, I think, the requirement to be very savvy about uh, how we were reporting, how we were uh, keeping our books, how we were um, organizing our board, defining our mission. Why? Because otherwise we wouldn't have got any grant money. Right. All right. Well, thank you all very much for joining us. And I want to thank the panelists uh, so much for joining us and, and sharing their wisdom. If you have any questions about fiscal sponsorship, I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, give me a call at 203-821-7348. And I'm extension 2. This is Allison of the National Library Permit Network. And thank you for joining us. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.